hello again. It's Dr. Ruben from Sangano. I bet you're tired of hearing that. Well, I can tell you right now, it probably helps you with your bonus questions. And if Jennifer put it in the and hat, helped you with your bonus questions. So I hope you got those bonus questions right. With that said, this is the third week. Can you believe it? We're past two weeks. We're halfway there. This last two weeks are interesting because often students have really put a lot into it. And some of these students are actually taking both online classes. So I really commend you. Other students are taking the one online class. You're taking other aspects on campus. You're taking other courses. Some of you are finishing up practicums and such things. And some of you folks are taking one online class. You have a family life. You have work. And you're doing everything. And I think most of you folks are doing a little of everything. And so I commend you. And so with that said, I want to let you know that it's the, the reality of it is, is that online courses are not hard, excuse me, are not easy. And I want to commend you. And uh, hang in there. you got two weeks left. We can help you out. We can get you there in the last two weeks, especially next week when all the assignments are due, the big papers. This is the time to, to not let up, to say, okay, I can get through this. I'm working on my papers. I just got my first exam paper. Um, I did all right. I think I did all right. Uh, I, could, I, I did great, or, or if I needed a little work, don't let up. Don't let up, as I always tell students, especially when these four-week, five-week uh, online courses. So with that said, I want to commend my uh, teaching assistant, uh, Jennifer Grieving, or Jen Grieving. She's been working really hard to make sure that this class goes well. And it brings back memories. It brings back memories when I was a grad assistant. I'm working with, uh, with Dr. Um, Dr. McAdoo. Uh, Michigan State University, Dr. Fenice, rest in peace, Dr. McAdoo, Dr. Fenice, who I keep in touch with, and she brings up those days when I used to work with her, and I would be doing a lot of the, uh, the responding to students' emails and uh, setting up the systems, and even though back then we didn't have Canvas system, we had other forms of systems. And back at Iowa State, when I was a master's student at Iowa State University, and working with Dr. Lillian Rippey, who has now uh, passed away, excuse me, uh, Dr. Rippey, Eloise Rippey, excuse me, Eloise Rippey, who has passed away, and working with her and her courses. And so what I say is, you know, hang in there and we're going to get you there. We're going to get you there. And this week we're going to do some more lectures. We're going to move into uh, discussions on marriage and parenthood and other aspects of family life. And then next week we're going to finish up the week. And uh, this week I'm happy to say that we're going to actually have our Zoom lecture. Uh, you've been signing up for the Zoom lecture. If you haven't signed up for the Zoom lecture, please sign up for the Zoom lecture. Please sign up for the Zoom lecture, uh, as that will be going on later on this week. Uh, so again, hang in there, and we're going to keep moving on. What we'll talk about today is marriage. And marriage is quite an interesting aspect in the United States and across the world. What we find in the world is that people are getting married less and less across the world. This interesting aspect that you find is that more and more people are people choosing to be single. Uh, and I don't mean cohabitation, because there are people who cohabitate for long periods of time. Uh, they'll cohabitate for life, though. Uh, and in fact, that's actually what uh, cohabitators are called, who cohabitate for life. They, they choose not to be married. Uh, marriage is not the uh, the institution that they believe in, and they believe in the cohabitation institution. So I'm not talking about institution and cohabitation. I'm talking about people who choose to stay single. Yes, you're starting to see more and more single people, and not only in the United States, but you're seeing more and more single people across the world. This has become more of a trend, especially with women. This is becoming more of a trend with women. And it's interesting enough people say, why is that? Because women are choosing lifestyle, career, and work. Now, let's not be mistaken. There are women who are choosing to have children, but they don't not, they're not choosing to have marriage along with those children. And so people always say, what are you talking about? Well, what we're talking about is, you know, maybe uh, a woman chooses to be artificially inseminated, or in some other ways, she might be, she might adopt a child. So I always tell parents, I always tell, excuse me, people in the modern era, times have changed, times have changed. From when, even when I was in my 20s and, and teenage, teenage years, that, you know, marriage was very much the norm. And let me be clear, marriage is still very much the norm in the United States, but not as high at the level as if it was 20 years ago. And so this idea of marriage, you know, becoming, you know, still very much the norm in the United States, but across the world, what we're finding is that marriage is actually going down across the world and you see more and more women not marrying. And so I think it's important to point that out from a global perspective. 
But within the United States, it's still very much the preferred lifestyle. Now, let me rephrase that. Even though marriage has gone down in the United States and singlehood is starting to go up, and across the world, singlehood is starting to go up. In the United States, marriage is still the preferred lifestyle for most Americans, okay? So let's not get confused with those statistics. Of course, yes, singlehood, we got to give it, give it the benefit of the doubt. Not everybody should get married. And let me give you an example. Now, now that I've been, I myself have been married for 15 years, my wife and I will be celebrating our 15th anniversary this summer. And it's, it's an honor to have been married to my wife for 15 years. And we've been together for almost 20 years. But with that said, I tell people, people should not get married for the sake of marriage or marriage. Uh, people get married all the time for the wrong reasons. Uh, people get married for what I call the wedding. And then after the wedding, you slowly, surely will see the end of the marriage. And most marriages won't last more than two or three years, unfortunately, in the United States regardless of culture although you find that european americans have a higher percentage but there's a reason for that it's because there's more european americans or anglos in the united states around 60 percent of the united states is anglo so yes you have a higher percentage uh, of anglos being divorced and you have higher numbers of our anglos getting divorced and we'll talk about divorce later on but there's a reason because there are more anglos in the united states now let me re let me repeat that People get married for all the wrong reasons. People get married for the wedding. People get married because they believe in this, this whole notion of what marriage is. And marriage is a beautiful thing, having been married 19 years, excuse me, 15 years. But with that said, marriage is one of the hardest aspects of family relationships that you can possibly have. It's very difficult when you look at marriage. And I tell people, people should not go into it lightly. In fact, when I first started off my career in HDFR at Iowa State University, my original plans were to become a counselor, a couple, family therapist, youth therapist. But one of my areas, children's therapist, one of the areas that I really wanted to focus in on was mate selection. As I talked about uh, in my last uh, audio, like, excuse me, my last lecture, uh, where I talked about where my mother took me to Mexico to find me a quote unquote wife. And at the time, I didn't know what she was doing. And then when I get there, I realized what she was doing. I, at the time, when I was at Iowa State and I wanted to be a therapist in HDFS, I really wanted to, to really pursue this and work with couples in what we call pre-marriage, premarital counseling, pre-marriage prep, or sometimes called marriage prep. I really wanted to delve into this and I run into work with couples. This is one of the aspects I wanted to do in my career. I wanted to try, my mother and my father had gone through an ugly divorce and I had seen divorce throughout my youth and childhood, especially during the 70s and the 80s when marriage excuse me, when divorce hit, it's max. And then, of course, in the 90s, it started slowly but surely going down, but not to, not to the point where we want it compared to other developed countries, such as Canada and other first world countries where, excuse me, divorce is not, is not as high as the United States. But going back to it, I wanted to really, really help with this pre-marriage because I thought that, well, I thought that, for all intents and purposes, I thought that if we could help couples you know, get to know each other, work with each other, deal with the issues that they were going to deal with in marriage. Maybe not identical, of course, but if we could help them get there, we could potentially help them stay together. All right. Now, so in this chapter, we're going to talk about those things. Now, some of the students have brought up that, you know, as their, as their lectures accompany this, uh, uh, you know, um, not always. You know, some of our lectures do have uh, outlines with them and not always. So I always re uh, recommend the students that that what they what to do is um is you know listen to the lecture audio obviously uh as you notice from the exam one there was a lot that came from my lecture and the book combined uh so yes definitely you got to listen to the audio lectures because a lot comes from it uh or video lectures in this case video lecture but i think the big thing is and of course your textbook we keep reading your textbook is this idea of if there's no lecture outline the important thing is to listen to the lecture and take notes as you would if you were in class i personally believe that taking notes is a learning method and actually it's well documented that if you if you you type or you write notes as you go along it helps you remember what you're learning so remember that remember that as you're listening to the lecture also it's important to listen to, to your audio lectures or in this case video lecture because 
you might potentially have some extra credit. And guess what? I'm about to sign you some more extra credit. Um, one of the things that what I want you to do is, is what I want you to do is in a page, page and a half, no more, double space. I want you to identify. I want you to identify. You know, a couple could be uh, could be heterosexual or could be gay and lesbian that you consider an ideal married couple. Now, what I'd like you to do is meet is identify someone who's been married at least 15 years and above. 15 years and above. And that's important. That's important. Okay. Not because Dr. Van has been married for 15 years this year. Of course, it's a major milestone. But that shows that there's been longevity, whether they had children or not. You know, and it doesn't matter. Like I said, heterosexual or gay or lesbian. So my big thing is a couple that's been married for at least 15 years and above. Why are they the ideal married couple? Uh, and, excuse me, an ideal married couple. And you can use your book, you can use your textbook to help you kind of outline that that marriage and why it's important and why it's what you consider an ideal. If you like to use the word ideal, how about a good role model marriage? Remember, heterosexual, gay, or lesbian, doesn't matter. Page, page and a half, do at the end of the semester, yes, or with all the extra, other extra credit I'm assigning you. And so here's one more extra credit that you can earn. And as I said, this will not be written. This is embedded in the lecture. Those students who listen to the to the audio lectures or the video lectures, guess what? You just got an extra credit. So with that said, uh, good luck with that extra credit, along with the other extra credits that I've assigned over this, uh, throughout the, in the last couple of weeks. And uh, let's talk about marriage. As I said a minute ago, people get married for all the wrong reasons. People get married for the wedding, for lack of better words. I can remember being at weddings, and it just really made my stomach hurt. And every summer, my wife and I, because we go back and we spent 10 years in North in Ohio and having taught classes in HDFR and early childhood education and having worked with students closely, uh, you find ourselves that my wife and I would be invited to marry, to weddings. And this year alone, we were invited to weddings, but it's all the way back in Ohio and we won't be able to make both weddings, but we would probably make it to one of the weddings of one of our former students who worked for my children as childcare. She had been my student in my class. and. Uh, but I can remember one wedding that didn't end up with my students, but this was actually a couple who was already in their, in their late 20s, early 30s. So it wasn't an issue of age. See, one of the statistics that shows is that the, the younger you get married, the more likely you are to get divorced or separated. And this is actually statistically for a reason. And is it because the, is it that I have not met any couples that have not made it? Of course not. Of course not. I know couples who met in their high school days and they got married uh you know they got married while they were in college when they were 19 years old 20 years old and they're still married and they've been married for 10 15 20 years or more of course of course but what happens is this is not typically the norm what has happened is what you find in the united states is because you do have adolescence and young adulthood as stages in life is that you find that people who get married at a younger age uh tend not to make it and there's a reason why it's because they're still developing they're still growing they're still made they're still learning about themselves, much less another person. It can be very difficult. And you, you wrap in career with that, family life, culture, religion, all those other aspects we talked about with May Selection. Remember the funnel? Remember that? Um, those are important aspects of marriage. Yes, mate Selection, that, that funnel, that filter that I talked about, is critical to, to marriage. And so that's why you often find that that statistic of if you marry younger, it's going to be more difficult for you to make it. doesn't mean you're not going to make it. And so I tell people, if a person gets married at a young age, let's say, in their early 20s, or even in their 19, 18 years old, you know, getting to know each other, really getting to know each other is critical, really getting to know each other. But this is the same for couples who might be older. In this wedding I went to, uh, I can remember, um, I didn't really know the couple that well. Uh, we had been invited by uh, family friends, my wife and I. And so they were more distant from us, but we had been invited through the family. And I can remember they, they were in their late 20s, maybe 27, 28. And remember, the average age for marriage now is like somewhere in that mid, mid uh, 20s, a little bit later 20s. And when you're, uh, it's becoming more a little bit uh, later 20s uh, for your like, if you're a male, especially a heterosexual man, uh, 27, 28, 29, 30, uh, you know, early 30s for men. And then those mid 20s for women. Uh, European American women, especially between the ages of like 25, 26. Um, for Latino women, uh, married a little bit younger, you'll find them at uh, 22, 23, maybe a little bit younger than that. African American women, a little bit older than that, similar to European American women. Asian American women, 
um, also a little bit later in uh, marriage, uh, uh, you're, you're Asian American women, Asian Pacific Islander women, uh, you're going to find them to get married uh, in their mid to later 20s, and they're Asian American men and Asian Pacific Islander men in their later 20s. Um, and Native Americans uh, are, you know, somewhere in their mid to later. Why do Latinos get married? Because the realities of immigration, because a lot of them, if they come from rural backgrounds, if they're immigrants and they come from rural backgrounds, uh, it's culturally acceptable to get married younger. Now, remember that with immigration, that changes everything for Latinos. If they're Latinos who've been here longer, um, their marriage age is going to be a little bit lower than European Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans. Uh, it's still going to be a little bit lower. So Latinos are going to be the, the ones that tend to be married younger compared to European Americans, African Americans, and Asian Americans. Now, here's the thing. If Latinos have more education, if they have more college education, uh, they'll tend to marry later. I myself was 30 when I got married. So that is the factor that makes a difference in Latino families. Uh, if a couple it has more education, they're going to marry later. They're going to mimic, excuse me, they're not going to mimic, they're going to mirror um, European Americans, African Americans, and Asian Americans. Now, Asian Americans, if they're immigrants, uh, they'd be similar to Latinos. So the immigrant factor once again kicks in. Asian Americans, if they're immigrants, and they don't have as much education in the sense of formal education. I'm not talking about education in the sense of moral education, but formal education. Asian Americans are going to marry younger, similar to immigrant Latinos. So what am I trying to tell you? The more education a person has, formal education, which usually means career, more career opportunities, they're more likely to marry later. That's what's happening in America today. Let me repeat that. The more edu formal education a person has, especially European Americans, African Americans, and Asian Americans, and you'll see it in Latinos too, um, they're going to marry later. For example, in my case, I was 30 years old when I got married and my wife was in her, she was 27, okay? Um, now, the immigrant factor for Latinos and Asian, especially if they're recent immigrants, they're going to marry younger, especially if they came from rural areas. So what am I telling you? One of the key factors that kicks in here is that women are choosing to marry later. Women are choosing to marry later because women are choosing their career and their pathways and just life. They want to enjoy life before they get married because often women are the ones who eventually care for the children when they first start. And so I think the big thing here is the whole sense of women are choosing to marry later because of career. And I think it goes back to the, what we talked about in the gender chapter back in the week one and two, uh, gender, where women didn't have access to education as much as they did before. Women didn't have access to career, even though, as I said before in the gender chapter, especially when we discussed feminist theory that women we're still may pay less than men, but what you're finding is women are choosing to marry later because their careers and their lifestyles are choosing to, for all these purposes, to re-engage in their careers and lifestyle, maybe travel in different aspects, or going back to get further education after a bachelor's, they might want to go get a master's, even a doctorate. And so what you're finding is the age for women is going up. And because of that, the age for men is going up. Because generally, as I said before, may selection, men are generally older than women in heterosexual couples. Uh, for gay and lesbian couples, you'll find that this is the case also. Women, lesbian, uh, lesbians, they'll find the career and those aspects puts them at a later age for marriage. And so I think that one of the things when we look at marriage is that the age is changing. And as I said before, even though the world, you're starting to see that marriage is starting to go down in a lot of parts of the world, uh, a lot of it is dictated by women, to be honest with you. It's dictated because they're choosing lifestyle over uh, marriage, early marriage, or even marriage at all. And I think that's very much prevalent in what you call the developed countries. Uh, the developed countries that, you know, where there is more financial stability and there's more educational opportunity and educational access. And I think that's that's a key aspect of this whole as a discussion on marriage is educational um, opportunities and access for women and financial stability for women that you didn't see in previous decades in the United States, uh, especially when you start to go out talking about uh, minority women. Uh, what you're finding is ethnic minority women, African-American women in particular is a good example. African-American women are choosing to marry later because they're looking to succeed in their career. Remember when I discussed with black families, I talked about knowledge is power. A lot of that knowledge used to help them in their career, help their community, of course, the collectivist aspect of, of family life, collective aspect of community, uh, black women moving up uh, the economic ladder still not making the same amount as their European-American counterparts. 
but and definitely not as much as their European American or Anglo counterparts, but you're seeing more and more black women choosing to marry later because of their career, their whole sense of knowledge is power. Now what about men? What we've always known is, is that men culturally, and this goes back centuries, depending on the culture, is that the aspect was the, the, the notion was that the man would be prepared to get married. And actually that was very common uh, in how it was approached, that a man needed to be prepared to be married. And a lot of it had to do with it was uh, um, uh, social maturity. Was the man ready to get married? And depending on the culture and the belief systems, which includes religion or values or social, political, cultural factors, familial values, all those factors, those ecological factors, some things determine whether a man was uh, ready to get married or not. I mean, if you want to go back to uh, uh, tribes and nations, excuse me, nations, tribes, clans, and bands, which is where we come from, not just Native Americans, um, you know, there was rites of passages for men to get married. Uh, this was very common in all civilizations. Uh, for men and women, there was rites of passages on what it meant to be a man, what it meant to be a woman, and when you could be married and when you could not marry. Um, in the modern era, what you find is that it might not be so structured in the sense of rites of passage, but there is a sense of that. When is a man socially mature and when can he make that step? And also, we look at this in the same way. We don't know enough about gay and lesbian uh, marriages because we've only started to look at marriage uh, amongst gay and lesbians in the last 10 years, especially legal marriage, uh, civil union, of course. And so I think that um, it's still it's still research that we're learning about when it comes to gay and lesbian marriages and when, you know, and civil unions and what that means uh, when a person's ready to get married. Obviously, individuals differ, okay? And I think that's a big aspect of marriage is that when, when you're ready and, uh, you know, and it goes back to when I talked about mate selection is what, what kind of person you're looking for. And, you know, um, whether a person believes that there's that, de that destiny, there's that one person, or as I said, that sense of pool, those eligible pools, uh, you know, there might be several people who might be the, that person, but it's all about timing and, and all the other aspects of career and where you live and, location, all those things, and cultural and values. And, and so when marriage, interesting enough, the mate selection lecture that we did is very much tied to marriage, um, definitely beyond the wedding. Um, and it really determines on whether a couple is going to be successful. I, you know, I gave the example, the, ex, the extreme example, of the, my student where the, the parent was Baptist and the other parent was Jewish, and they're still been married for over 30 years easily now. Uh, but this is not common. Okay, As I said, this is not common. And as with mate selection, I said that a person is probably going to end up with someone that's more similar to them. doesn't mean there's necessarily the same culture or religion, but more similar values and beliefs. And generally, sometimes that means culture, you know, social economic status, maybe religion, obviously education. We talked about that in mate selection. And so um, what we're going to do next is we'll, we'll transition and we'll, we'll make this lecture into two parts. We'll transition and we're going to talk about a theory that a gentleman and actually an institute uh, Gottman or Gutman uh, Institute, uh, which for decades they've, uh, for several decades, excuse me, they've looked at what makes a successful marriage. And they came up with a model called the Four Horsemen. And it talked about, you know, that couples would need to look at these Four Horsemen and really kind of get a sense of everybody goes through the Four Horsemen and how they would, how they would deal with the Four Horsemen to have a successful marriage. So that'll be part two of our, our lecture.